Okay, so I'm gonna admit something up front of this video. Oh, hi. Zero Score here. Go watch the first two videos if you haven't yet. We are on part three now, and I'm starting to get to the games I've been putting off covering because I don't like them as much. But my goal is to cover any suggested game that the audience might like, even if I don't always. And I really want to be as positive but fair about them as I can be. But for one, not all these suggested games are created equal or deserve positivity. And two, I think isolation is starting to get to me. I'm going kind of stir crazy, you know? It's hard to think straight. I'm just in my own negative head a lot. I feel like Gollum, but my one ring is just the desire for a good game, and all you people suggesting games are a company of hobbits throwing the good games into a volcano over and over again. So yeah, just wanted to get that disclaimer out there that as the games get worse, so do my opinions. I'll try to be as positive as I can be, though. We wants better games. We wants our precious. Oof. I'm definitely getting crazy. And less creative. The escalating apocalypse shtick of the last two parts was way more culturally relevant, and this video has nothing to do with Lord of the Rings. Surely I could have come up with a more fitting, talk to yourself gimmick to show the effect isolation is having on me. But then again, I've also been watching a lot of Galavant, so maybe I'm just feeling extra self-referential. Galavant did it better! Hack! Original hack! Shut up, you! <sighs> Alright! You should know the drill by now. Seven more games across varying systems and of... varying quality, unfortunately. My precious... Yeah, let's get to the games before this gimmick gets old. It already has Gollum! James Bond, Bloodstone. I'm gonna be honest, I did not play very much of this game. Mechanically, it felt good for a DS port of a game that was obviously meant for console controllers, but trying to emulate the touchscreen controls with a mouse, because I was emulating it, was tricky while also holding a controller, so... I didn't really care to keep fighting the controls, but I liked what they were able to do with the limited button layout for the most part, and it actually looks great for a DS game, with some nice cinematic cutscenes that are fully voiced even if the audio quality kinda sucks, which is part of the course for the DS to be fair. You can keep your face. I put my trust in bond. The way it is able to put a fairly competent cover shooter on a handheld is impressive in its own right though and it seems like there's an interesting amount of mission variety like most James Bond games have, so that's nice too. The one part that was kind of awkward though was the close range melee combat, because it essentially becomes a quick time event using the face buttons, whereas basically everything else just uses touchscreen buttons and one side of the controller for shooting and stuff. So it feels awkward to have to quickly switch from touchscreen to face buttons just for that. I think I'd enjoy this game more on actual DS hardware, but it's definitely not bad. I just struggled too much. Scourge Hearth. This game was suggested to me as a fun, unique take on the Metroidvania genre. And while that's about as accurate as you can get for this strange mix of genres, it also gives it a little too much credit. Let me be clear, I enjoyed a lot of the weird top-down isometric action games on the GBA, I even suggested everyone play the handheld Spyro games in a past video. But the way this game plays and the amount of buttons available just make it extra janky compared to other isometric games, aside from just being kind of tough to navigate thanks to 8-directional movement on a 4-directional controller. To start, the game throws a lot of enemies at you that respawn when you leave the room and come back. So just getting from point A to point B can be pretty tedious if you get lost and have to backtrack. I know respawning enemies is nothing new, but in this game you not only have to juggle your health, but also a scourge meter that fills as you get hit, or just slowly over time from environmental influence. And when it reaches 100%, your health just starts constantly ticking down. And as far as I could tell, the only way to prevent death is to spam kill enemies for meager health refills and hope it's enough to counteract your impending doom. But since the combat is awkward at best, it's pretty easy to take more damage than you heal by killing them. 
You purge the Scourge at progress checkpoints, but because of the amount of going between the same rooms trying to figure out where your next objective is, the Scourge meter isn't very forgiving and can often lead to a death, which means starting back at the last checkpoint. That's not fun. I will give it credit, because I can tell the actual Metroidvania gameplay loop is there, and I'll never get over that satisfying grind of when you get a new tool to help you progress, but something about the top-down perspective just doesn't feel right. Maybe it's the way it's hard to tell what platforms you can reach, or it could be the issue that limited buttons mean you can't move and attack at the same time, but I unfortunately found myself wanting to like this game more than I actually did. It kind of reminded me of another top-down Metroidvania from a past video, Divide Enemies Within, and I'll admit that it's at least better than that weird thing, but that's not saying much either. If anyone wants to argue I didn't give this game a fair shake, though, feel free to tell me what I was missing that would make me like it more. I'd love to be proven wrong. Wade Hickson's Counter Punch I can only guess that this game is intended to be a parody of games like Punch-Out, or at least a parody of the boxing genre, because there's no possible way to take it seriously. It literally starts with a cutscene of every man main character Wade Hickston driving with his boxing gloves on. Now, I'm not the type to tell people how to live their lives, but I don't think it matters how many hands you have on the wheel if those hands are inside comically large rubber mittens. That's bound to be unsafe. Luckily, his car breaks down, and someone gives him a lift to the local pub, where he's immediately solicited to fight by a ridiculously large man who apparently also just wears boxing gloves all the time. If I'm just judging these games on presentation, I gotta say, aside from the unsafe driving conditions, this one's winning me over so far. And I don't even like boxing. Gameplay-wise, though, well, let me put it this way. That sudden first fight is not a tutorial. It just drops you into a boxing match and expects you to figure out the controls. There's no hints, no options on the pause screen, just a burly man throwing rodents at you, and you left with your scrawny wits about you. It's weird. Like, does the game expect you to practice first? All I did was select a new game. Why wouldn't it ease me into things? That being said, it's fairly normal boxing controls. The face buttons control each hand, and D button up and down moves where the punches hit, left and right dodge, but only briefly so timing can be tricky, and the shoulder buttons handle uppercuts. But at least for someone who isn't into boxing, it can be hard to see what the opponent is telegraphing in order to block or dodge, and it's pretty unforgiving considering it just throws you in. It might sound like I gave up quick, but honestly this was all I needed to see to know this game wasn't for me. I love the presentation, but as a boxing game, it was an uphill battle in the first place for me to enjoy it. The best I can say about it is that it's a competent and entertaining take on a boxing game, especially for what the GBA is capable of. Let's move on to a genre I appreciate more, though. Sphinx and the Cursed Mummy. Did you like Egyptian stereotypes? Do you like chunky 3D action platformers trying their best to ape the success of the Zelda formula? You like sand? I don't like sand. It's coarse, and rough, and irritating, and it gets everywhere. Well, have I got a game for you! And... it's fine. The presentation of the game is great. It really took me back to my youth playing all kinds of hypercolor, graphically stylized 3D adventure games like this. But I didn't really enjoy exploring the world very much. It's one of those games where you get to a new area and it tells you, I bet if I get that thing, I can do the thing and get to the place. But then in practice, most of those things aren't actually very fun to do. And there's a lot of mechanics to keep track of, especially since you control two different characters throughout the game with their own distinct playstyles. Sphinx definitely has more of the knockoff Zelda type gameplay, complete with Magic Sword, but neither feel terribly special to play as. There's just a lot of bloat to the level mechanics. Like throwing rocks at trees to knock down and collect coconuts or throwing rocks at a hole so bugs come out and you lead them to certain spots, or throwing rocks at enemies to hurt them. Basically, early on, it's a lot of throwing rocks. And despite the obvious pun, none of it rocks. I'm also not a fan of anything dealing with sidling ledges or climbing rope. When will games learn that climbing rope is never a fun mechanic and almost always looks stupid? Even in newer games, you'd think they'd have figured out all the physics of it. 
Give me a grappling hook, or a ladder, or, like, sticky Spider-Man fingers. Ropes are stupid. Honestly never realized my hatred for rope up until this very moment. You really do learn something new every day, huh? Anyway, Sphinx game. Right. Rope issues aside, I can see what this game has to offer, and it definitely brings its own style to the action platformer genre. And like a lot of GameCube games, the graphics actually hold up really nicely, though it's worth noting the game has been remastered and ported to more current consoles, so if it interests you, probably grab a newer version. But something about it just felt generic. Like, it's a solid 7, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't do anything to make itself stand out, which is probably why it never really made an impression and remains a hidden gem despite multiple re-releases. This game is... interesting. It's very heavy on mechanics, but weirdly light on actual execution. At least as far as I understood it. At first glance, it looks like you're a pretty standard RPG. You wander around getting quests from NPCs and engaging in combat where you use a variety of weapons and magic. But that's about where the comparisons end. Now, stick with me, because explaining this game is gonna get a little chunky. And I don't even totally understand it. Most of the mechanics revolve around a magical book the hero carries with him, and a demon creature that inhabits the book and acts as a guide and magic source. You can slam the book down on different objects to catalog them for information, new skills, or attribute collections. That's where I got a little confused, actually. Your weapon is modified using a kind of Tetris-style grid full of different shapes. Any attributes that affect the weapon have to fit inside that grid. So, you might be able to combine fire with a poison status and higher attack power, but you have to give up something else to fit all those things together, for example. But trying to manage your various attributes can be a little clunky. Really, all the menus in the game are fairly unintuitive thanks to being basically pages in a book. And your demon guide always wants to pop in and chat between pages, like he's Clippy from Hell. So, just Clippy then, I guess. That's a very 90s reference. Whatever, 90s kid. Where was I? Yes, so apparently the spells you have to access are written in the book, but I couldn't really figure that part out. I guess you select the spell on the bottom screen and then the demon casts it? I couldn't get it to work, and it would just pause the action when I went into the book, and Clippy the demon would warn me about something again. I started tuning him out, so I don't remember what, honestly. I'm sure it was important, but whatever. All of this is to say that what at first seemed like a fairly traditional, albeit slow-paced action RPG, ended up confusing me more than anything, so it's just kind of another game that maybe had more potential, but I didn't care to get past the learning curve. Maybe that's on me. It doesn't help that the game opened slowly, like I said, so I had all these mechanics thrust on me before I even knew anything about the combat. Which, speaking of, was also just... Okay. Rolling and slashing. That's about it. Well, and magic, I guess, if it works. I don't know. I even debated not covering this game because of how much I didn't understand it, but these lists are for your sake as well as mine, so I'm happy to discuss the merits of it in the comments below. For now, though, let's move on. Astral Boy, Omega Factor. I get recommended a surprising amount of licensed tie-in games, which... I guess kind of makes sense, because if people didn't actually buy them, they wouldn't keep shitting out terrible licensed games, but most of them end up not even being worth playing, much less talking about here, so... Color me surprised when I look into an Astro Boy movie game, and I find it almost universally praised. To preface, I know almost nothing about the property, so I basically went in blind, but the game was made by Sega, which has occasionally been a promising sign. So, I strapped in and prepared to be pleasantly surprised. What I found was a game that actually looked really visually pleasing for the GBA, with a lot of enemy variety and some really nice animations for Astro Boy's various attacks. It's a fairly traditional beat-em-up, where you move along each level until it stops you and sends various enemies after you to take out, but what sets this game apart is how fluid the main character feels, despite having a pretty substantial moveset for a system with four buttons. He can jump, air dash, punch, kick, shoot lasers, and release a, a, a butt turret? Like I said, I know nothing about this character. Is that his signature move or something? 
Oh, is that like the Hodor reveal where he was just saying ass turret over and over again until it melded into the word astro? That's clearly the only explanation. <laughs> Jokes aside, there's honestly not a lot to say about this game. It's a polished and competent licensed beat-em-up game with simple controls and satisfying combat. There's also some on-rails shoot-em-up sections and light platforming to occasionally mix up the gameplay, but it's nothing revolutionary, it just does what it does well. Dragon Quest Heroes Rocket Slide Let's take a little trip back in time, all the way back to June 2020. I know, it feels like forever ago, but stick with me. I mentioned in the last video how there's a handful of way better Dragon Quest spin-off games. There's some neat Dragon Quest games out there, including cool spin-offs like Fortune Street, for example. But this is just not one of those. Remember? Good. Here's one of those. <laughs> it's admittedly still not an amazing game, but it's got a lot to like. It reminds me a little bit of the Pikmin series, since you control a creature that goes around levels, picking up various items, enemies, and other creatures, and sending them off back home to your home base with a day-night cycle that makes things way more dangerous to stay out past dark. You play as one of the iconic Dragon Quest slimes, and this game oozes all the charm, humor, and puns of that series. The characters you rescue all have unique looks and personalities, similar to how Paper Mario used to handle its party members, and the dialogue is excellently localized and full of some of the best puns in gaming. All what you'd expect from a Dragon Quest title. Unfortunately, like Pikmin, the actual way you control your character and interact with the levels leaves a little to be desired. The gimmick here is your slime is special and has the ability to stretch and launch himself for platforming, combat, etc. But this is how you pick anything up, attack enemies, all of it. And you have to make sure you're back far enough to actually stretch and not overshoot whatever you're reaching, or you might just take damage instead. It also just kind of gets old launching yourself all over to do basically everything in the game. There is some variety here, as you can also throw whatever your slime is holding to do damage to enemies, and sometimes you have to throw specific things in order to solve minor puzzle sections, but it's still a very simple and repetitive gameplay loop. Grab whatever is nearby, throw it on one of the rail carts that cross by various parts of the levels to send those things back to the village, and then duck back before dark so the uh, uh, Drakis don't kill you. I think that's what they're called. All I remember is they apparently eat children. Anyway, the levels are expansive and have some really interesting verticality and side areas to explore in order to find all the slimes, and there's also some boss battles to break up the monotony, but like I said, it's all pretty basic. It's nice to see a good Dragon Quest game that isn't an RPG, but I do wish there was a little more to it. Though I will say after I played the game and everything, I looked up some more and found the main thing people love is controlling like a rocket mech or something, but I guess I didn't get that far in the time limit, so I can't say if that makes it better or not. Sorry. It probably does though. Mechs are dope. I will say though, it's really cool to see all the stuff you can collect actually show up back in the village, including enemies that seem totally cool with chilling out there peacefully. Like I said, this game brings a lot of great dialogue and personality. I just wish the rest of the game could rock it the same way. Eh, that pun worked better in text. I'm sorry. And there we have it! I hope you still enjoyed these seven games, since I lowered your expectations of their quality. Honestly, I should do that for all my videos, but you probably already have low expectations if you're a fan of mine, I guess, so it's fine. Burn that's good we did! <laughs> Alright, I'm ending this video. I've thoroughly exhausted all the jokes, and there's no more games to unintentionally shit on for right now, so let me know in the comments what you think of these games, and if I was too mean. But don't be mean to me. I'm fragile. Let's just love each other, okay? But also, suggest some better games to me. Please. My precious. I'm not the type to tell people how to live their lives, but I don't think it matters how many hands you have on the wheel if those hands are inside comically large lo- I don't think it matters how many hands you have on the wheel if those hands are inside comically large lo- Lubber. What? I keep wanting to say leather.
comically large flubber hands. I'm also not a fan of anything dealing with flo- I'm also not a fan of dealing- What? Or throwing rocks at a hole so bugs come out and lead you- What? Learn to read, bro. Give me a grappling hook or a ladder. Or like, sticky butts- Sticky fu- Fu- Sticky fondue hands. And the dialogue is excellently- uh, This game is... Interesting. It's very heavy on mechanics, but weirdly light on actual ex- ex On actual eggs. This game is light on eggs, y'all.